Hello, welcome to Maya 101. So like I hinted at last time, I wanted to talk about textures more. So we've talked about UVs, texture coordinates, on a 3D model. We've talked about materials and creating a material in the hypershade and connecting textures to this material and so on. Uh, you know, briefly, there's a lot more to it, of course. This, again, remember, this is like a foundational series. So don't expect to get into super deep stuff until you kind of understand the basics, the foundations. So textures. Textures is a big topic. You know, textures makes up a large part of creating any kind of asset. You know, you do all the modeling and so on, but then it's just, you know, a gray block, essentially a gray mesh before you actually have any kind of texture applied to it to bring it to life, essentially. Texturing is very important. Uh, like I've mentioned in my classes before, you can have an awful model but if you have a really great texture on it it can just save your model right i mean there's some technical things that if you have a really bad model that it won't save but as far as looking at it if you're showing like a screenshot of a, a model of say it's a bad model but has a really great texture it'll look really good but let's say you have a really great model like you've done a fantastic job modeling but your texture is poor your model will look poor the textures are very important you know regardless of the quality of the modeling itself. So it's important that we understand how to, number one, how to make textures, and number two, how to continue to improve textures. Because texturing, just like anything, just like modeling and anything else, takes practice. You, know, you have to keep doing it. And the first ones you do are going to be, you know, bad, we'll say. And the next ones you do will be better than the first ones. And the next ones you do will be better than those, and so on. And just keep getting better and better and better as you do it. Okay, so let's I'm going to bring up the hypershade again. We talked about the hypershade a little bit last time. Uh, but just going to bring up a, let's say like a Lambert material. I'll go to Maya surfaces. Let's say Lambert right there. Okay. So like we mentioned before, your, your materials have inputs and outputs. On the left, inputs. On the right, outputs. So the left, all these inputs are essentially asking for a texture of some kind. Now, we didn't talk about it too much, but you'll notice that a lot of these uh, inputs have a little plus sign next to them. And if you click on the plus, it'll expand. So you see here, for example, for color, we have three different channels here. We have three different inputs, red, green, and blue, that all kind of correspond into color, ambient color. Same idea, RGB, red, green, blue. There we go. And But some of them don't, like matte opacity. If we look at matte opacity, or let's say diffuse right there next to it. Both of these don't have a plus to expand anything. So diffuse is right here you'll see and it's and unlike color which has like this swatch, this color box, I can click the swatch and choose a color. Diffuse doesn't have that, it just has a slider, a value. So that's a difference. So the color has three values, a red value, a green value, a blue value, so we'll say, while diffuse has a single value. So there's two different types of uh, settings or attributes with different values that it's looking for, different values that it outputs. One's color that has red, green, and blue, and one is a value for diffuse, okay, for translucence. For all these things that just have uh, sliders and a number by them, those are all just values. Now you can apply textures to these values. The difference is you're not, they're not looking for red, green, and blue, they're looking for black and white. So the common term essentially is a mask. Okay, So you can have masks, a mask texture for almost anything. And like we mentioned last time with the transparency checkerboard, you know, I'll just do it again. Since we have it open here, transparency, I'll click on the little map button to apply a texture to it and I'll just add a checkerboard. And we kind of see it up here. So with a, a checkerboard mask, I'm just going to, for the sake of visibility, I'll make a sphere and I'll just middle click and drag my material onto the sphere and press the six key. There we go. I'll just move this over. There we go. So this is an example of a mask where the transparency is being controlled by a black and white checkerboard. If you applied a color to the checker, so I'm bring this back and click on the checker and let's say instead of black and white it's you know red and uh, we'll say blue you'll notice that the transparency doesn't really like that as much whenever I see this here 
it doesn't really, really display like I would hope it would because this is looking for black and white values. Go back to the checker, it's off on the top other side of the screen here, but I'm just gonna make it black and white again, and now it works again. So masks are black and white. And the idea behind it is that wherever the mask is white, the attribute will be at 100%, we'll say. So transparency, 100% transparency, wherever this texture is white. If the texture is black, the attribute will be at 0%, so it's opaque. So a white value in the transparency map makes the value transparent. Or where that checker, where that white checker box is, the, all the checker boards are, it's transparent where it's white, and it's opaque where it's black. Now you can use the same idea if we take the checker off of uh, transparency, and let's say we apply it to, I don't know, incandescence. I'm just going to middle click and drag onto incandescence. So here you can see that wherever the white of the checkerboard is, the incandescence is 100%, so it's glowing essentially, like a light bulb, where the white of the checker is. Wherever it's black, it looks just like it would any other sphere that's not doing anything. It's just a regular same gray color as any sphere. No, nothing happening. This is zero. The, the incandescence is zero wherever the checkerboard is black. So these are masks. So you can make custom masks. You can use painting programs and things to paint white where you want certain things to be and paint black where you don't want them to be. So you can control the attribute. You can control where the incandescence is. Where does the light bulb glow? It glows where the bulb is, and but not where the little metal base is for the light bulb, as an example. So you can paint black on the texture where that metal base is, and white on the bulb when you want it to glow. And so just the bulb will glow and not the metal base. So you can mask these different uh, attributes on the model. Okay? So that's kind of a general idea regarding masks. Now, that's masks, if are majority of what you're going to make for the most part. You know, there are exceptions. So for me personally, me, Michael, talking, I come from a video game background. I work in the video game industry, real-time applications and things like that. The types of textures that are used in real-time applications like video games are different than the types of textures that are used in rendered media, such as movies and visual effects and th things like that. There are some similarities. So if I, because I'm going to probably be more than likely focusing on kind of video game uh, usage on textures, but they're they're not going to be the same as if you're on film. And I've never worked on films, so I can't necessarily, I can, I can uh, comment based on what I know as far as knowledge goes, but I don't have ex personal experience in films. But essentially though, this masking technique is the same uh, for those films as well. It, a lot of the technical side of things changes for film versus games because you're working in a real-time medium with different rendering effects and so on, different uh, concerns regarding, say, uh, bump maps versus normal maps, you know, as an example. Like, you may not know what that I'm talking about, but a bump map is something you can see here. There's a bump mapping attribute. Bump mapping is something that was more of a rendered thing, while normal mapping, normal maps, are something that's real-time. Okay, so normal maps, for example, are not used in film for the most part, as far as I know. I could be wrong. Let me know if you think I'm wrong. But uh, from what I understand, films use a combination of bump maps, displacement maps, height maps, those sorts of things. Or And while games use some of that stuff, but also normal maps is a big deal too in video games. Because the normal map, the way that normal map works, and we'll get into it, is it, it uses uh, real-time lighting to create the effect that normal maps do. All right, so you might be thinking bump maps, normal maps, displacement maps. I have no idea what you're talking about. So let's kind of talk about textures and how we're going to go about it. So like I said, I am come from the gaming background. So what I'm going to probably, I'm gonna, what I'm going to show you is the kinds of textures you make for video game work, for video game work, not necessarily for film. But there is some crossover and there is some similarities. So it's not like you're going to be completely, you know, it's not going to be useless if you're not interested in games and are more interested in films, for example, to know this information. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so we have here, you know, the checkerboard attached to the incandescence of the material. And you, you might say, well, if I expand all this stuff, 
just just for the sake of example. There are so many of these checkerboard icons. Are you saying I have to have a texture applied to every single one of these attributes? No. No, you don't. And especially in, and more so in films, okay? You might have a you know, you might have color, transparency, incandescence, about mapping and, and so on. But in games, you're gonna have a kind of a standard number of textures. Okay, so I'm going to open up a program called Substance Painter. Because I think this is easiest to show with this. So let me open that up. So while this is loading, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of uh, how textures used to be made a long time ago. Oh, good. It loaded pretty quick there. But essentially, before Substance Painter and programs like it, textures were made using Photoshop, primarily. Photoshop and, pro and programs like that. You know, 2D painting programs. Um, I guess I'm, I can load Photoshop while I'm talking here. Let that be loading too. Just maybe show some differences. So for example, I'm just going to be talking about different examples and things. I might as well bring up some examples. So some of my old work that I made prior to the advent of things like Substance Painter and I made using Photoshop. Okay, so Ignore the website. That website is no longer in effect. Um, so if you go there, I can't promise what you'll find. So I recommend don't go in there. But this this is also an old email address I don't use anymore, so you can ignore all this stuff. This is a very old picture. But essentially, this was for a video game for Saw. Uh, Saw, if you're not familiar, is like this uh, kind of torture, horror, uh, gory movie series. And I worked on a video game adaptation for it. So... This was something made for Saw, and I, I used exclusively Photoshop to create these textures. And again, these are old textures, old models. This is from years ago, uh, so old stuff. But uh, I did use some techniques to kind of bake ambient occlusion, which again I'll talk about in a second, uh, into this model from Maya and different things like that. That helped, you know. But a lot of it I had to kind of paint by hand or use uh, texture sources like, you know, rusty metals and things like that. I brought in his photos and kind of tacked on and moved around and added in where the, they should go. And so let me go back to Substance Painter here. Okay, so let me just go and go, let's see, recent files. Let me just open up something. So this is a file that comes with Substance Painter. It's a Jade Toad uh, sample file. Okay, so this is a model here in Substance Painter, they're doing some cool things to it. So I'm just going to show, show you the textures that are applied to this model. So if I press the uh, C key, and you see this drop down menu, this is going through all the different textures that are applied to this model. So if I press the C key, C is in channel, and this is the base color channel. So this is the color texture. If I press the F1 key, you can see it here on the left. I'm going to close some of these other windows just for the sake of clarity. Here we go. So this is the, the texture that is just color information for the frog, this jade toad. Press the C key again. This is height, and it looks like they are not using height information. You'll see it's all black. So for this particular case, height, I note there is no height map. There's no height texture. Press C again. So this is roughness, the roughness channel. So again, this is a mask, black and white mask, and you might say, well, this is more grayscale. Okay, yes, that's true. Just imagine a, a black and white mask as where it's black, it's zero, it's white, it's 100%, right? So black is 0%, white's 100%. So then you have all the grayscale in between. So a true 50% gray would be a 50% value. So roughness is a texture type that I want to explain in a bit. Okay, but I'm just kind of going through, just showing you first, all the different textures that are actually applied to this model. So there's a metallic texture. In this case, they're not using metal, metalness. Normal, there we go, scattering. This is a scattering mask. Once again, black and white, where white's 100%, black is zero, and then you have the gray uh, values in between. So here's a normal map. Okay, this is what a normal map looks like. It's typically this kind of uh, uh, bluish, purplish, tone with, if you look close, you can see different values of red and green and, and blue. It's, it's red, green, and blue is what it is. 
And the way this works is, you know, you've already we've already talked about kind of the cardinal directions in 3D space. You have X, Y, and Z, or red, green, and they're represented by red, green, and blue. But you see that in Maya. I can go back there real quick. And, uh, and down here in the lower left corner, you can kind of see there. It's kind of small. I use my move tool actually. I'll make it bigger. So essentially, Y is represented as a, a green color. X as a red color and C as a blue color. So that's just kind of a typical 3D language. This RGB representation of X, Y, and Z. So with a normal map, I kind of see another one here I had open recently, actually. It's kind of a good transition there. Here's the Photoshop, you can kind of see it. A normal map uses red, green, and blue values. And so how the light, when light hits a surface, this is a real-time application, by the way, like a video game. When you have a light ray hit the, the pixel on the texture, it looks at the color and determines which direction the light bounces based on that color. So you get, in this case, press the M key, you get the illusion, you can see it here, of the, all these little bumpy details. You might be thinking, well, isn't that just in the model itself? Wasn't the model, doesn't the model just have all these bumps all over it? And the answer is no, not necessarily. If I click on here, you can see that the red lines are the mesh. So it's definitely got some bumpiness to it. You can kind of see here in the profile of it. You can kind of see it looks almost like these little pyramids. Let me get really close. It's kind of almost like a sort of points, these vertices that are pulled up. And it's kind of go straight like this from here is really sharp. There's sharp angles. However, if you look at it the way it looks very soft, all these little sharp little pyramids look very soft. Same with like this spiral, for example. If you look at it from a profile, you can see here it's very faceted actually. You see a straight line, straight line, straight line. But if you look at it from a little bit of a distance, it looks relatively soft. And that's because of the normal map. It's using this normal map, press the B key again, to control that with how the lighting affects it. Same with like these wrinkles over here. Stuff like this. All right. And then we have opacity, which is like transparency. Not necessarily using that. It's all white, so it's all opaque. And then this is called a world space, normal. And then we have ambient occlusion. Okay, so ambient occlusion is kind of giving you the shadowing effects of crevices and cracks and things like this like in the nostrils and around these wrinkles and things. You can kind of see those things. That's what ambient occlusion, I guess, another texture. These are all different textures. And so I press the M key. This is the combination of all those different effects. Okay, the combination of the, go back here to color, roughness, metalness, uh, the scattering, uh, normal map, and then also the another one, which is the ambient occlusion, is also included here. Press the M key, and we get this all this these different textures working together to create the combined result. And this is a real time mesh, not a film like a film 3D rendered like Pixar or something like that. Okay, so now that you kind of get an idea of what they look like, let me go and tell you what exactly they all are. Now, I will say, let me go back to these again. So the ones that are common to be used, like I use them every single day, is the base color, roughness, metalness, although this one's all black, the normal map, and the ambient occlusion. All the other ones are there because this particular model is using a certain effect called subsurface scattering, which is not something that everything uses. If you were to take off the subsurface uh, scattering, for example, you wouldn't get, you get a different look to it. Let me find the subsurface scattering. Here it is, subsurface scattering parameters turn off. There we go. So here it is on and off. And so with it on, you can kind of see that look of, kind of like when you shine a flashlight through your fingers or your earlobe, you kind of get that inner, inner glow effect. 
that's what the scattering texture does with this type of material. And against the subsequent scattering parameters, turn them on or, or leave them or turn them off. So with them off, you don't get that certain effect. It still looks like a decent mesh. You're just not getting that kind of interesting inner glow look to it. So that's just something that was chosen. So if I leave that off, this is what, you know, typically the textures that are used in games. You have, again, I'll go through it. You have base color, okay, number one, base color. Roughness, number two. Metalness, number three. And even though this one is black, because it's not metal, it's, it's this, if it was, if so the way metalness map works, and we'll, again, we'll get more into it, Wherever the metallic or metalness map is white, that surface or that part of the surface is considered metal or metallic. Wherever it's black, it's not metal. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty cut and dry. You don't usually use a lot of um, grayscale in a metalness map. It's usually it's metal or it's not metal. Okay, so that is also true too. So base color, one. Roughness, two. Metallic, three. Normal, which is actually more this one. Four, okay, and then ambient occlusion five. So those five textures are probably the most commonly made textures for any 3D object. Okay, so if you have those five, you can make your model look pretty much as good as it can. Now, of course, there's other things like transparency. That would be six if you wanted anything to be transparent. There's also the subsurface scattering, like we've shown here, that's seven. You know, these adding in these extra things for these extra effects, with transparency probably being the most common uh, fifth one, or what's the word, sixth one, I guess. The most common sixth one is transparency. Another common one would be an emissive or glowing. So if you have, say, fire or something like that, or if you have like a robot and you have like all these little glowing lights on it, that would be an emissive map or an emissive texture. That would be something you add to your standard five to get an additional effect. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense and we can start going into how to make it. So what I thought in order to kind of demonstrate this um, in a practical way, I'm actually going to use my plus and minus keys to make this smaller again. I'm going to actually stop this recording for a second and I'm gonna bring up the pencil I made earlier and let's just take that pencil and texture it and do everything as if it was a real game object. So it's going to be kind of a demonstration in that sense. So give me a split second and I'll be right back. All right, so here's the pencil that we made in an earlier video. So before I really get going on, like, all right, we're going to texture this pencil, right, or create a, an object from this, this all textured and colored, we need to talk about something that is actually relatively important that we haven't touched on yet. And that's a little bit of an oversight on my part. It is kind of something you should know in the beginning, which we're still pretty much in the beginning, even though we're kind of seven parts <laughs> into this thing. But uh, creating a project directory, okay? Uh, so if I go to the file menu, down here we have this project section. And so we click open up project window. And with project window here, we can create what's called a Maya project directory. So for example, we can create a new project, and this is what you'd always do whenever you start a new project, okay? Um, eventually, once you kind of know everything, <laughs> or at least know a lot of, uh, you don't necessarily have to do this every time, but when you're first starting out, I do recommend, like, before you start something new, you go to File, Project Window, and say New for the project. And here, now you can name the new project. So let's say we call this one pencil okay then you can browse to a location so I can browse to my Maya tool belt folder here and I'll just use that one so the D drive Maya tool belt is with the location of this new project and the project is going to be called pencil and down here it says primary project locations and it has all these different names so scenes templates images and so on and you can change the names of these if you want to, but I typically just recommend everybody just use the default settings. And then hit accept. Okay, so what did that do? Nothing really seemed to happen. But if now if I browse my computer and go to, here's my Maya tool belt, you know, folder here on my computer. Now I have this pencil folder. Open that up. And I have all these folders. 
the scenes, you know, images, cache, autosave assets, all these different folders. And you'll see here a workspace.mel or mel, and that's that uh, Maya embedded language that uh, Maya uses. And so what this does now is Maya will know that we are working in the pencil project. So I'm going to go to File, Save Scene As, and you'll see that it immediately goes to my pencil folder, Scenes folder. So I'm saving your Maya scenes or Maya files into the Scenes folder. So I just save it again here, Save As. See a result there, I saved it into my Scenes folder. So whenever you're dealing with a Maya project directory, you're always going to save your scenes into the scenes folder. Let me bring that back up. There we go. Into the scenes folder. That's where you'll put all your Maya scenes. If I open this up here, you'll see now I have pencil.ma there. So when it comes to textures, and this is pretty important, you're going to save your textures always into the source images folder. That's where Maya looks for textures. Okay, so you might not understand exactly why this is important, but we're going to get there. Okay, so let's just say, for example, you have two projects. I'm going to go to File, uh, Project Window, I'll say New again, and I'll just call this one, you know, Example Second Project. <laughs> All right, Accept. So now if I go to File, Save Scene As, it's going to my Example Second Project Folders Scenes folder. Okay. Well, I would say, let's say I've, I've been working on all these different projects, and now I'm going back to my pencil now. Okay, I'm going to go to File New. So I'm going to go to File, you know, Open Scene, and I'm going to go to my Pencil Project, Scenes folder, and I'll open up my Pencil file. Okay. And let's say I'm working on it, and I go to File, Save Scene As, but it's going to the Pencil Scenes folder. However, it might not understand which project it's actually in. Like it says here, current project, and it's looking at Maya tool belt example second projects. See that? So all these source images folder, for example, the textures folder, it's going to be looking in that folder for that project. And so what you can do here is lots of little shortcuts for setting your project. Set project. So if you're working in one project and you move to another project, you want to go to file or whenever you save it, you can say right here, set project, or you can go to file, set project, right here too. And you'll choose, say, the pencil project folder, the top folder there, not, not like one of these, but here, the actual topmost pencil folder, hit set. So now I've reset the project into the pencil project. So go file, save, scene as, and now it says current project is my tool belt pencil. So whenever we start making textures, it'll know to look for them in the source images folder here in the pencil project and not in that example second project folder. So you might think, well, I'm only going to ever work on one project at a time. And when you're first starting out, that's probably true. Okay. So you might not have too big of an issue. However, there are lots of benefits that are like behind the scenes for having everything organized in this way. So I do recommend you still uh, create a new project directory whenever you create a new file or new project that you're going to work on and especially when you start when you do start you know making multiple things and going back and forth it'll be much more important then so it's a good habit to get into okay so here we have this pencil that we made earlier on let's say we want to like just take this to completion and actually create a textured pencil object what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you how we would I would do this for a video game or a real-time application like I currently do in my current job. Now this was for a film, and let's say you have a character, you know, like uh, Buzz Lightyear in the latest Lightyear movie, uh, as of this recording anyway, and you have like a really close-up view of him signing his name on a piece of paper or something with a pencil. So that pencil, when you're really close to it, needs to be nicely high detailed, such as this pencil we have here, where whenever you were to see it from an angle like this, but it's like in his hand, you can see the you know, the eraser and the little bracket here holding the eraser and how there's like some depth here. Like it's not just flat. It's not just a cylinder, right? 
and then like the tip of the pencil here actually has a little bit of depth there and so that kind of thing is much more important in a film however in a video game you know typically a pencil would be a very small background prop right but let's just say for the sake of this we're making a close-up pencil for a video game so how would i go about doing that so we're going to be going covering a lot of stuff through this since this is kind of like a covering the gamut of texture creation or even like you could even just say like an asset creation for a video game so use hopefully using the pencil will hopefully make it be a bit simpler and that you can you can kind of grasp the concepts for and apply those other things so what this is actually this is a high detail mesh that's like or high res mesh that's another way of putting it that's a very uh common phrase a high res mesh high detail mesh and for video games, you typically want a low res mesh or a low resolution. That's what res means, low resolution mesh or a low detail mesh, okay? However, we can do some fancy tricks to make a low resolution mesh look like it's a high resolution mesh. And we're gonna show you some of those tricks now. So this is our high resolution mesh. So I'm gonna name these props, these pieces. So this is the eraser. And then this is the, we'll call it a bracket. I'm not sure what the actual name is. And then we'll just say this is the pencil itself. Okay. I'm going to group all these. I'll select all three. Control G groups them. And I'll call this pencil underscore high. As in high resolution. High detail. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a second pencil. But this time being aware of poly count. So when I say poly count, if I go to display, heads up display, poly count right here, we can see how many polygons or how many individual faces are in our object. So currently with this high detail pencil, this is over 16,000 triangles. And tries or triangles, that's the number that, are, that matters for a video game. So anytime anybody says, oh, this is, you know, a thousand polys, that's like a common way of saying that. This is 10,000 polys. They're talking about triangles. Okay, because that's what matters in a, in a game. Or 10 million polys these days. But for a pencil, you don't want it to be 10 million polys. You want something to be really quick and efficient that can be, you know, have like a stack of them or like a cup of pencils, you know. So you don't want like each pencil to be a million polygons. That would just be insane, right? For a video game to run. Or at least run effectively. So I'm going to create a low detail version of this pencil. And so what that essentially means is I'm going to model over this high detail pencil with a low one. And what I tend to do is I like to select all my high detail mesh components here, right click and hold, assign a new material. I'll just use a Lambert, that's fine. And then with this new material, I'll just make it darker. I'll just drag down the color. I can even call this Lambert here. I'll call it high detail MAT for material. So now it's kind of a darker color. So now when I bring in a new cylinder, that new cylinder has that default Lambert 1, which is a lighter gray color, and I can easily see the contrast between the two. So, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to decrease the subdivision's caps. I'm going to decrease the subdivision's axis. I'm going to take this down to about 6. So we have a similar you know, hexagon profile. Scale this a bit. And I'm just going to have this same shape kind of run along the shaft of the pencil all the way, we'll just go all the way through like this. Now you might say, oh, this, it's, it's so different, you know, I, and I, I could potentially see, you know, maybe rounding off the end here, but we'll just see what this looks like. Because the idea here is to make this a low detail model that's very efficient. So now I'm going to grab this face, hold shift and pull it out to extrude. I was going to extrude all the way down here, scale it down, and I could potentially see going this far. And maybe extrude this out. Now this is a, this little extrusion here is adding quite a number of uh, polygons to our model, and it might be too inefficient to actually have this little bit here. It might be better, as far as efficiency goes, to just simply have the point of the pencil go all the way to the end without this little edge loop right here. Because in reality, this is going to be so tiny on a video game screen that no one's really going to be able to see it too close. 
that's another thing to be aware of is, is where is your audience going to be seeing this thing? How close are they going to be? Okay, so we'll just, there we go, call it done. So my low detail pencil here, if we look at this middle column, this is the, the details of the model that's selected. The left column is the details of all the models in the scene, and the right column is when you're dealing with components. So this middle column is saying that this one pencil has 44 triangles. Okay, 44. And still relatively high. I, I, I would, I'm very tempted actually to just grab this edge loop here and control delete and remove it. And I think I might, just because I'm such a pessimist, I guess, about <laughs> uh, how many polygons I'm using, I might just do that. So just taking away that one edge loop, we're down to 32. Okay, so we've gone down quite a bit just for that one edge loop. So we can just try this and see how it goes. I mean, there's more we could do, but it's a pencil, right? It's supposed to be simple. Now, one thing I am going to do is I'm going to soften the edges. So I'll go to Mesh Display, Soften Edge, like this. But I want the faces, the, or the caps, I should say, of each side to be hardened. So I'll grab this face. I'll go to Mesh Display, Harden. I'll do the same for down here. Press the G key to redo the last thing I did. Okay. So that gets rid of those facets. All right, I'm going to freeze transformations, delete history. And there we go. I can rename this to be pencil underscore low. Okay. All right. So for next, what we need to do is, so this is essentially the modeling is completed. You know, the, the long part was creating the high detail mesh. The, the low detail meshes usually are much quicker to make, especially for something as simple as a pencil. So there's my low detail mesh, and I'm going to do the UVs. You know, we've done the, the UVs before. I can actually just grab my high detail one and hide it. Only the low detail mesh requires UVs, typically. So I don't need, I don't need to UV the high detail mesh. That one can stay whatever it is. So this one I'm going to go, to, again, to Panels, Save Layouts, Perspective, slash UV Editor. Okay, I'm just going to go to Create, Camera Based. So I guess that camera projection we talked about before in my camera based projection video. I'll select this little face here and I'm going to use this button there, which you may not have. So it's under the cut and sew create UV shell. Okay. I'll do the same for the cap face on this side. Just grab that face on the cap, cut and sew, create UV shell. And then I'm going to select an edge loop running along the bottom of the pencil and go to cut and sew, cut. So I cut the cap faces and then one edge loop running along the shaft of the pencil and I cut there too. So now I'll go to tools, show UV toolkit, which I'll just pull over here. Okay, and there's lots of stuff in here. I'll go down to the unfold section and I'll just click the unfold button. So that essentially unfolds the UVs like we talked about before. I still want to straighten these up a little bit, so I'll grab an edge loop here and I could say a straighten shell. So that's this, and then we have our different UV shells. Now I will say that because this is a long skinny object, it might actually be more efficient or more you know beneficial to have it actually angled like this. So we can take up more space from corner to corner of this UV layout. I just put these circles anywhere really. Something like this. Now I will say that what this will mean is that the pixels of our texture are going to be diagonal on our object, which might be an issue. You know, if, if what's one thing I do tend to do is try to make my UV shells straight. So by having it at a diagonal, like an intentional diagonal like this, we are opening ourselves up to having uh, diagonal pixels on our texture and that might come into play you know we'll see if it does maybe I'll come back here and, and change it okay that's all I really need to do as far as UVs go so again I can delete history freeze transformations these buttons over here so there's my I'll just reveal this so here's my high detail pencil and my low detail pencil okay 
Now what we need to do is actually bring these two meshes into Substance Painter. And actually now, while I have this high detail mesh selected, you can see the UVs over here. The fact that these are all kind of messed up and messy and not workable at all, that doesn't matter. We're never going to really use those. So here's my low detail mesh, my high detail group here. So I'm going to select my pencil high group, and I'll go to File, Export Selection. I'm going to export this. So I need to export this, and I'm going to use an FBX export. You can also use like OBJ exports, and there's other kinds of exports you can use. There's all kinds you can choose from, but depending on what you're working in, like if you're working in certain games that might require an FBX, or other things might require OBJs, some things might have completely custom exports that you need to do. But I'm going to use FBX, and I'll name this, and you see here it's going into pencil scenes, that's what we want. I'll name this pencil underscore low. Actually, this is the high mesh, sorry. And that actually reminds me, that little warning, I'm glad that warning popped up. Let me actually hide my low mesh for a second, control H to hide. So you remember we're using the smooth mesh preview for this high detail pencil, right? You press the one key or the three key, three makes it into a smooth mesh preview where we can see it all nice and smooth. Now I want you to remember that that is called a smooth mesh preview. And what that warning that popped up just now reminded me was that, hey, this is set to a smooth mesh preview it's not going to actually export as smooth because what we're looking at here is a preview, right? So what we're gonna do is press the three key for all of our high detail meshes so that it is set to a smooth mesh preview. And I'll go, I'll select one. I'll go to modify, convert. Here we go, smooth mesh preview to polygons. So instead of having a smooth mesh preview, it'll actually have a smooth mesh. Click it, you'll see here immediately it it's a lot more uh, faces involved, but it now is actually smooth and not just a preview of being smooth. Modify, convert, smooth mesh preview to polygon. I can select the eraser and press the G key, which does the last thing I just did. So now that these three meshes have been converted to actually being smooth, again, I want to freeze transformations and delete history. That's a good habit to be into. I'll select that pencil high group again and go to File, Export Selection. This time, I'm going to call it pencil underscore high, which is what it actually is. Bring back my low pencil. Shift H to unhide the selected object there. Selecting it, I'll go to File, Export Selection, and this one, this one will be pencil low. I can replace that. Okay, so we're going to switch now from Maya to Substance Painter. All right, here we are in Substance Painter. So you may not have Substance Painter, I don't know, but um, I recommend getting it. If this is something, if this industry, this uh, field is something you're interested in, I believe you can get an educational license uh, to be able to use Substance Painter without paying anything. I think that's true. At least I know it used to be. Hopefully it still is when you're watching this. Um, but it's definitely worthwhile if you're wanting to get into this seriously because this is really the best program for texturing, especially game objects, you know. All right, so I'm going to File, New, here in Substance Painter. Brings up the New Project window. For the selection, I'm going to, I'm not going to necessarily focus a lot on everything in Substance Painter like I do in Maya, just because I'm typically, a, generally, a Maya channel, right? But I am definitely am seeing the need to get into Substance Painter a bit more going forward. But for now, I'm going to go to Select. Make sure I'm in my Pencil Project. Here we go, go to Scenes, and I'm going to open up my pencil low.fbx. Here I can say how large of a texture am I going to make. This is set based on pixels. You can see here the different uh, pixel sizes we can choose from. It goes from 128 by 128 all the way up to 4096, which is really big. Uh, typically, you'll scale the document resolution of a texture based on the size of the prop. So this is a pencil, so it's relatively small. So typically I might go really tiny with it, but for the sake of this, just for the sake of example, I'm going to make like a really, really nice and crisp detailed pencil as if the camera is going to zoom in really close. So let's go ahead and just make it, you know, like a 2048, like really big uh, texture for a pencil. Everything else I'll leave as defaults. And I'll hit OK. All right, so there's my low detail model. 
just like we saw earlier in Maya. The, the camera controls and such here in Substance Painter uh, mimic that of Maya, which is nice. Now there is this kind of camera anchoring feature, like depending on where you're looking on the model, it's going to like anchor and round that point on the model, which here you see it's not really doing it, so I gotta kind of, you know, it gets a little funky, and maybe go over here. Yeah, so you press the F key to frame it. See, now it's kind of pivoting around that point there. So it can get a little fun, finicky as far as cameras go. Okay, so the next step I'm going to show you is the magic of what we are talking about before with normal maps, with all the bumpiness on the frog, for example. We're going to do what's called a bake on this pencil. We're going to bake the detail from the high detail mesh into a normal map for the low detail mesh. So up here in the top right, there's this button here. It looks like a, a white box with a little gear in the corner. I'm going to scroll down and go to Bake Mesh Maps. Okay, this is the baking window. Now this one has an, another output size regarding texture resolution. So again, I'm going to make this 2048 as well, just to make sure it's still nice and crisp. And so for the high definition or high resolution meshes, I'm going to click on this little new button. This looks like a piece of paper. And I'll choose the pencil high.fbx. Hit open. Okay, so now it's looking at that file there. And I'm just going to keep everything at defaults for now. And hit bake. It's going to run through the process. Okay, hit OK. So you can see here, we're starting to see a little bit of detail being baked into the texture. Now you'll see here that the eraser looks it looks okay at certain angles, but like like here. But over here though, it's like, oh wow, that looks bad. And go over here and you can kind of see there's the tip of the pencil there. You can kind of see the line there where the pencil lead would be, right? So there's one thing I typically do, and you also can see these ridges running up down the, sh the shaft as well. So when I bake uh, normals and things, I'm going to click back over here. You can always rebake it as many times as you want. I like to test it first, but I'm going to uncheck the average normals box and bake it again. And let's see if that makes it any better. Hit OK. So now you see on this end, I can see the detail of that bracket and such, and it looks nicer from multi more than one angle. And so, especially if you think about a pencil from, you know, seeing it from a little bit of a distance, you know, at least like this, you know, that that detail we're getting there on the bracket, you know, that's fine. Now, one thing I might do is I might go ahead and go back to the model and bevel this end of the pencil eraser so we get a nicer rounded edge. No matter how good your normal map is, you're not going to change the shape or the profile of the mesh. I can just it just looks like a cigarette almost. That was just sticks out there and caps off. So going back to my model then, I'll grab my low detail model here. Select this face and we'll add a bevel. Edit mesh bevel. Just a fraction. Something like that. And I'm gonna select these edges and soften them again because they get unsoftened when you do that. Okay, now when you do that, it adds geometry, and so the UVs might change. So let me select my low model down here. So you look down here, you can see, we can see these little gaps in between all these faces when I uh, did the uh, bevel. So I'm going to grab these edges and make sure I uh, sew them back together. If I go to cut and sew, sew, that kind of closes that up. And then just to make sure the proportion-wise everything looks okay, I'm going to go back to my tools. And I'm going to say unfold again. And you see it kind of modified a little bit here. I can say optimize a couple times. Might have to click it a few times, you know, and just to make sure that the UV space here is being used optimally. All right, that looks good enough. So I'll go ahead and export this low poly model again. So I'll select it. I go to File, Export Selection, Pencil Low. I just copy right over it. Export. Yes, replace it. There we go, back to here. Now, just because we come back to Substance Painter, it's not going to automatically update the mesh. So I actually have to go to Edit, Project Configuration, 
and then I can select a new pencil low. So I can select pencil low and open and OK. So now we have that beveled mesh. However, it looks kind of funky because I need to rebake it again now with these new UVs. So I go back to bake mesh, bake mesh maps. Average normals is not checked and bake again. And okay, so now this looks much nicer. See that? So much nicer than it was before. And you can still see it from, like if you look at it from flush, you can definitely still see the hexagon kind of shape, but you know, from a little bit of a distance, it looks much, much nicer than it did before. So this is the magic of baking normals. This is what video games and real-time applications do all the time to make a low detail model appear as if it's a high detail model. Okay, so now we have the bake done. We can go in and start actually doing some texturing. So you might say, all right, cool, I'm gonna paint you know, on this thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how I would do this, or how I would actually do this. So I do have a reference image. So I've got a picture of a couple of different uh, pencils here. We have the kind of typical orange ones with like the um, chrome bracket here with the kind of uh, reddish eraser. Then we have the Ticonderoga uh, pencil which is used in schools a lot and this one has more of a green tint with uh, more of a yellow more of a pink eraser that kind of thing and then different colored wood and stuff like this so this is going to be our, our kind of texture guide as far as how we want the pencil to look toward the end and so I'm gonna bring I'll you know click back on this every every so often to uh, remind you and myself on how we want this to look so what I'm going to do is actually go back to Maya. I'm going to show you another trick I use. Okay, so I'm going to hide my low. So we already did all of our modifications to the low. Control H to hide. And so now my high model, my high detail model, I'm actually going to apply colors to this. And you might be saying, like, why would you want to do that? Well, if we go back, and we're going to go back and forth a lot. But up here in this little drop down menu, if I go down to mesh maps, mesh maps are the ones that get baked. So, this is, for example, I can go to normal. You can see here, that's what the normal map looks like that was baked from the high detail mesh onto the low detail mesh. And you can cycle through these by pressing the B key, B as in boy. So this is world space normal. Here's an ID map, ambient occlusion, which kind of gives you those little crevices and things, right? A little kind of darkening, darkening over here. Curvature. The curvature map is not used in the game necessarily, but it's used by Substance Painter to find where the curves are, where the edges are. And the position map, again, used by Substance Painter to know where certain things are, which comes into play. Uh, thickness, like how thick the pencil is, again, used by Substance Painter, not used by the game itself. And in height, uh, some of these aren't really used. So anyway, for this ID map, this ID map one is just gray because if you remember, I applied that kind of dark gray color to the high detail pencil, so it comes in as gray. So if I actually apply color to the high detail pencil, it will come in colored. And we, we can see different areas in the pencil that way. So I'm going to actually use that because it's really helpful for um, creating your textures more quickly. So I'm going to select my shaft of the pencil here, right click, assign a new material, I'll use a it doesn't really matter what colors or anything you use, but I'll just go ahead and use kind of you know pencil-like colors. So yellow, for instance. I'll select my bracket here, assign a new material, Lambert. I'll make it say blue. I'll grab the eraser, assign a new material, Lambert. I'll make it kind of a reddish pink. There we go. Now for the tip down here, because this is all one piece of geometry, I actually need to go in and select faces. So I can select these faces here, I'm actually going to get a better angle. When it's something like this, I have a hard time finding the right angle. I might select a face, hold shift, double click to select a row, and then hold shift and greater than, so shift uh, period, shift period to grow the selection out until I get to all this. Oops. There we go. Right click, assign the material. This one I'll make kind of a darker gray. And you see I missed some faces over here, but now I can just kind of grab all those and assign existing material now. It's the latest Lambert I did. I, I should probably name these, but 
Lambert 6 in this case. There we go. So now it has that same color on it. Now for the wood color itself, again, I might say select a row of faces and grow my selection shift period. Something like this. I don't want to get too many faces though. I don't need all that. I want to kind of make the wood of the pencil a slightly different color. So somewhere around this angle, I have all these faces selected. Right click, assign the material, Lambert. And I can make this one kind of a, a brown color. Okay, there we go. So now I have all these colors assigned to different faces and parts of my high detail mesh. I'll re-export my pencil, export selection as the high. Yep, replace it. Back in Substance Painter, if I go back to baking, I don't necessarily need to bake all these again. I can actually uncheck everything I don't want to bake. So I'm just baking the ID map in this case. Hit bake. There it is. So now I have all these colors applied to the ID map of the pencil. You might say, well, what does that do? Because I press the M key, M shows you the material again. Those colors don't actually show up. Again, the colors are not used in the actual texture. They're just used to help us make the texture more quickly. All right, so just to keep this simple, here in the library of Substance Painter, let's say I do a search for rubber. So we have a couple of rubbers we can choose from. We have uh, composite ceiling tiles, which is not rubber, but here we have plastic, sand, grain, medium. Okay, we have other rubbers here as well. We have rubber tire, plastic, you know, different things like this. So let me just, I, mean, I can use this rubber tire one. So I can click and drag this rubber tire material onto the pencil. You can see it, it applies it. But if I undo that, and if I hold control down while I drag the material, it looks for the ID map. If I click on and drag it to the eraser, this red color, it only applies to the eraser. So that's where the ID map comes in. By having those colors applied to the high detail mesh and baking those in like this, we can just simply right, control, click and drag different materials onto different parts of the model where those colors are. It makes things really, really quick. It applies an automatic mask to the rubber tire material I have here. Now, I don't want a black eraser, so I'm going to open up this folder, and here's the rubber base. And again, there's a lot of stuff here. That we're going we're going this into a new program, essentially, without really talking much about it. So I do encourage you to to learn how to use Substance Painter more better than I'm showing you. <laughs> but by clicking on the rubber base here, I can choose a different color, such as a pinkish red or something. Now this is a rubber tire, so you can see it has all these kind of scratches and things in it. It's this wear layer. If I hide and unhide that wear, you can kind of see what's going on there. So I could just hide it and just have kind of a nice smooth look to it. Or if I want to adjust it, I can definitely go in here and, and play with these settings. You know, play with the balance, sliders, contrast. You can just, I love playing with sliders and just seeing what happens. I don't necessarily always know what's going to happen but it's fun to play with them sometimes. But I think I'm just gonna hide that layer or delete that layer completely and just keep it a nice smooth eraser like this. So over here on the right side, you can see we have all these different sliders and these are controlling those textures we talked about, the base color, the height, roughness, metallic, and normal. One, two, three, four, five. These are your basic five textures that you'll always make in a game or a real-time application like this. And what's nice about this is you can always control these. So I, I adjusted the color already, but then we also have height. So I adjust the height. You can kind of see around the edges of where that color is showing up, how it's grab, grasping the light more or less. I'm going to keep the height at zero in this case, and I can just turn height off by clicking on this name up here. So this particular layer is not adjusting height at all. Uh, metallic, I'll make zero. It's definitely rubber. It's not a metal surface at all, so we're not going to be dealing with any kind of um, metal. Roughness, as it goes up and down, you can kind of see what happens if with high roughness, 
it's like a lambert where it's not very shiny. But with low roughness, it becomes like a mirror, very super shiny. You can see this kind of reflected environment in the rubber. So you can adjust how reflective and how shiny a surface is by adjusting its roughness. Less roughness means more shiny because the surface isn't as rough, it's more smooth, right? So it reflects the light cleaner. If, as the surface gets rougher, it reflects the light more broadly until it kind of becomes matte. It doesn't reflect anything at all. So, yeah, it's kind of cool to see the differences. So you can kind of fine-tune that little sheen I'm getting there until I get something that I kind of like and move on. And then normal, I'm going to turn that normal off. We're not really using that. So, yeah, these three, you might say we're not using metal either, but I am using it in the sense that I'm telling it not to be metal by making it black. So I'm going to keep it like that. Okay, and so now, that was the eraser. Let's look for chrome. There we go. Chrome, blue tint. We can just use that. And again, I'll hold control while I click and drag and drag onto this blue color. And there we go. We've got this chrome material now applied to where that blue color was in our ID map. Makes things so much simpler and quicker when I do that. As opposed to like having to paint this by hand. And then for the shaft of the pencil, you might think, okay, wood. But really, if you look at you know a pencil's without it being sharpened, it's more like almost like a plastic because it's, it's paint, right? It's like a latex almost that's wrapped around the wood that you kind of sharpen off whenever you uh, make it sharp. So instead of a, instead of looking for wood, I might look for more of a plastic thing. So let's do a search for plastic. We have like a plastic glossy. And don't, don't worry about the colors. You can always change colors. Kind of looking for, yeah, this glossy thing will work, I think. Control click and drag onto the yellow. Now this one comes with some kind of surface imperfections and things that you know our nice and smooth pencil probably wouldn't have. So I'm going to open up this folder. and also going to change the color, of course. Instead of blue, I'm actually going to use a color picker. Oh, I actually need them. I'll have the picture on the, my other monitor to do this, actually. So color picker, and I'll go over here and choose that yellow color from the picture. There we go. Although, looking at the pictures again, the Ticonderogas pencils seem to be more round and smooth, while it's the orange pencil that's more that kind of hexagon shape. So maybe I should actually be using that orange color if I want to be right, realistic or something. Doesn't really matter to me. There we go. So I picked it from the picture. I can always adjust it more if I want to, you know, adjust the saturation or the levels, things like that. Height, not really going to use it for this. And yeah, so then we have, so they have different, different, there's different layers, right? So this roughness grunge. And then we have dust. Now we also have this fill down here. We haven't talked about that too much, but that's what's adding in this kind of uh, pattern of this rough pattern breaking up the surface. And if you looked at a pencil microscopically, maybe I would see that. And maybe it's, since I'm thinking about it from like a, a little bit of a distance like this, it might not be too big of a deal if it has a little bit of that roughness to it, but I think it's a little heavy. So there, over here, if I click on it, I have this 100. This is actually a opacity slider. So I'm going to zoom in really close. And I'm going to lower this down. Oh, I know why I didn't do anything. You know, okay, it's a good point actually. Uh, up here, I'm looking at the color and this fill is only affecting height. See that? So as I lower the opacity of this fill layer's color, it's not doing anything because the color is not doing anything. If I change this drop down menu to height and then adjust, then it works. It looks like it was already set to a one before I even started doing anything. So it's almost not doing anything at all. So I might just, I might just get rid of it. <laughs> I can get rid of it, or I can adjust the histogram a little, because I think it's a little rough. It's, it looks a little... I don't think it makes sense for the pencil, to be honest. We're not looking at this thing under a microscope. I'm just going to click that little X and get rid of that pattern of roughness, that rough 
uh, choppiness on the surface, make it nice and smooth. Even if in real life it wouldn't realistically be smooth, uh, that's okay. In video games especially, having things be 100% real isn't always the point. It's just the point of video game is to be fun, right? Especially, especially for a pencil. <laughs> All right. All right, then we have the wood of the sharpened bit. So I can do a search for wood. Again, Substance Painter comes with lots of different uh, presets of materials and things you can choose from. Let's see here, we got this kind of bamboo. I look back at my reference, you can kind of see it here. It's kind of, uh, this one, this orange one anyway, has more of a lighter color to the wood than the others. We can always adjust colors later. Now we might not find, oops, wrong button. We might not find like the perfect wood to use. We may have to be more custom with it, but that's okay. Light wood grain, yeah, that might work better. Control, click and drag onto that brown. And there you see it gets applied. So over here I can go into the folder. Whoops, trying to make this, there we go, drag this down. So this wood grain actually has a lot of a lot of layers to it. We'll go down here to the base, and it has this gradient that's controlling the color. So I click on that gradient, and I can play with these colors a bit. So I'm, I can just lower down the uh, saturation. Again, I'm not trying to make this perfect. I'm just trying to show you some pretty powerful things that such as painter can do. All right, so then we have like wood fibers and things. And you, what I usually do is like hide and unhide the layer and see what it's controlling and then determine if I want to change it or get rid of it. So this, for example, has these kind of diagonal streaks. I might, I might toss that. Either toss it or I could try uh, changing the direction, but I think I'll just toss it. I'll just, unhide, I'll just hide it with this little eyeball button. I'm looking at, I'm looking at it from my preferred angle here. Okay, and then also, if I look at this, it's very shiny. And that wood shouldn't really be shiny. So let me go back to the base and let's see here. Here's roughness, and see how the value is all the way down here? I'm going to inc increase this roughness, and it makes that shininess kind of fade away. So it's a little bit more wood like. Okay, and then finally, for the tip itself, I mean, we can do a search for graphite. I'm not sure if. Yeah, Substance Painter has graphite specifically, um, but we can just kind of, here's charcoal. It might be close enough, especially for something as small as this little tip here. Yeah, I mean, if looking at it from a distance, I mean, you never know that it's, that it's charcoal, right? It's just so so small and it's just dark. And so essentially we've got our textures here. Press the F1 key, you can see the texture, how it's laid out here and all the different colors and such. If I rotate the light, rotate the light, by the way, if you're learning how to use Substance Painter, if you hold down the Shift key, right-click and drag, it rotates the light around. Yeah. Okay, F2, we'll take it back to just being single vision here. Now, we could call it, hey, I got my pencil, but what I want to do is look down here and you can see we have some like letters and things that we can put on. Also, those little dimples I mentioned back when I did this a few uh, videos ago. We could add stuff like that in and things like that. So, for the lettering, I'll show you how I typically do lettering. I'm going to add a fill layer. We have, there's paint layers, or otherwise known as just standard layers. But, or you can add a fill layer. Add a fill layer. I'll call this uh, letters or lettering. And now I'm going to just do color so I can hide everything else and just look at color. And I'll make the color black, essentially. And I'll turn on roughness as well, because I'm going to say that I can't really tell in the picture, but I'm going to say that whenever these letters get stamped into the side of the pencil, the lettering is not as shiny as the rest of the orange of the pencil. So I'm going to take that roughness up, so it's more rough. It's also going to be zero metal, so it's not going to be metallic at all. Okay. And then as far as height goes, it's actually going to be down a little bit. So we're stamping into the surface by lowering that height. Now right now, all it looks like is I just covered the pencil in black. But what we're going to do is add a mask to this black layer. So this button here looks like, or 
looks like a circle and a square. Click this, and I can say add a black mask. So a black mask means that it, the, the values of the layer is set to zero. So it goes away, it's hidden now. So in this black mask, this, and if, if you're familiar with Photoshop, you'll know what masks are. And you can see here that all these different things that we've been adding have masks associated with them because we've been using that control key to drag them onto the model and it automatically masks them based on that ID map that we made. So, but now we don't have an ID map for those letters. We have to do that more by hand. So into this mask, I'm going to click on this magic wand button to add an effect. And I'm going to add a paint effect. Okay. So what kind of paint effect? So if I do a search for font, make sure I'm not looking only in the materials. You can see we do have some lettering tools here. Now, Substance Painter comes with certain fonts. If you want to add your own, it's a bit of a complex process. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I did add my own here with this kind of Arial font up here, which is probably closer to what we would actually do, but you more than likely don't have this Arial font available since I added it myself. So I'm going to go ahead and just stick with the ones that come with Substance Painter, which I will admit aren't the greatest in the world. Uh, let's see, I'm just going to use Jura. I think it's probably the best bet. So I'll left click on Jura here, this font Jura. Okay. I'll scroll down. There we go. And I'm going to, here it is, parameters under the alpha is font Jura, parameters, text. I'm gonna, I can type in the text I want. So in my reference, the picture says this is a Dixon pixel. I'm sorry, Dixon pencil, <laughs> not pixel. So I'll just do that here. And you can kind of see as I mouse over the pencil how my brush now has the word Dixon on it, right? So I can also say for type, I can say bold, so it makes the letters a little bit bolder or thicker. And let's see, we have size here, so we can increase or decrease the size of the text. And if you go too high, it'll it'll get cut off, so I don't want to do that. So something like this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, again, looking at my, my reference here, you kind of see about how far up from the eraser it goes, maybe about, you know, a quarter of the way. And my pencil looks a little short, just so it's been it's been sharpened a bit. <laughs> so I'm going to go up to here, we'll say, and left click. And there we go. We now have Dixon. You can see here it has a little bit of kind of a stamped in look to it. You can kind of see how the light's catching it. And if we want to adjust that, we can go back to the layer and we can play with how it can be bumped up, it can be bumped down, we can go back and forth. So I can lower the height even more. If I really want it to look like it's deeply dug in there, I could do that. I can play with that roughness if I want it to be shiny inside those little grooves, or if I want it to be more matte, like I have it here. Be metallic. Which is hard to see with this being a black color, but you probably don't really want that though. But yeah, I can just kind of stamp in my letters. Okay, so I'll go back to the mask, back to the paint effect. It's important to make sure you don't just click in the mask. You want to go, go to the paint effect that was added to the mask. I can type a new word now. So my again, my reference it says this is a number two pencil, right? So N O dot space two. And then there also it says, and I'm not a pencil expert, but it also says slash HB. HB. Oh, I'm not sure what HB stands for when it, in the world of pencils, but okay. So I'll do space slash space HB. So my letters are extending beyond the size of the brush. Okay, there we go. So I'll make sure that I scale my brush since I had to change this, the font size. I got to scale my brush up a little bit, make, and I'm just kind of eyeballing it next to where I've already stamped to make sure the letters are kind of the same size. So I'm not uh, making them too small. And then I'll move over here and left click and there we go. Number two slash HB stamped into my pencil. Okay. Easy peasy. No, pro no problem. And if we wanted to do it on the same side on the other side we can do that too but I'm just going to keep it there on the one side. 
All right, so then we I was talking about those dimples on this thing. So right now I'm just, I'm still stuck on this brush with the, where it says number two pencil. I'll go over here and go back to my brushes, and I can just do the basic hard brush, and I'm back to this, or a basic soft, back to my default brush. Okay, so now I'm going to make another fill layer, and this one's only going to be height, and I'll lower it down. I'm going to punch in little dimples into the uh, eraser thing here. So I'll add a black mask to this layer. I'll add a paint effect to the mask. And then I'll make my brush a little smaller, a little harder maybe. And boom. So that just kind of punches a hole, or makes a little dent, I should say, into the eraser. I'll, I'll do that. So looking back again at my, in here, at my reference, you can kind of see this little blurry picture, but kind of see these little boop, 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 boop around where these ridges were. So I'm going to make this a bit smaller. And I go back to this and make, make it a bit more intense. And I even add a color to it and make the color a little bit darker. And then I might even go as far as like metallic is zero so that it stands out a little bit on this metal bracket. So something like that. So I can just punch in these little divots, you know, wherever, wherever I want. And this is what I was talking about before when we were making this pencil, saying that, you know, I might not even try to model these divots in because I can just use, do texture work later and kind of add them in this way. You might say, well, when I look at it really close, it looks kind of funky, but what really matters is how close is the viewer going to see it. And really, if someone's got like their big hand coming through here and holding this pencil, you know, maybe at this kind of angle, you know, this, this, and this is say the size of a TV screen or whatever, this is however big it's gonna be. You know, they're not gonna be zooming in like this, you know, in most, most circumstances. Okay. So we could go on from here, we could uh, do some more things like, for example, Whenever the mask, the uh, transition, I should say, between the pencil and the wood, well, it's it's not bad. I could see going back and maybe doing some hand touching to that. Like, for example, for the light wood grain layer I have here, we have this color selection mask so that whenever, like, we know that's where the wood's coming in. And if you alt-click the mask, you can see it as a grayscale like this. M key goes back to seeing it like this. So I could say, for example, add a paint effect to the mask. We have multiple layers in here. And go back to my brushes. And let's just say I use, I don't know, something like this maybe. And I can go in here and kind of play with that transition between the wood and the pencil. Now, I don't want to go too, too far with it because it's where the pencil is straight, that would be where the pencil has not been erased yet, right? So just kind of going along the edges. So it's not so such a hard edge. Or not quite so obvious a, a pattern on the edge, we'll say. I press the X key to switch to black. I can, you know, undo what I did there. Just gotta be careful not to erase the wood like this. So what might be better is to use the eraser tool, which is the second button down, and I can erase what I've done completely. And go back to where to start, kind of, oops, extra white, kind of play through it again a little bit. Just kind of breaking up where that wood is showing through. Again, all we're really worried about is what it looks like from a little bit of a distance. Same thing as for where it transitions to the, the lead. It might be a little too clean through here. Now, because the charcoal layer is actually above the the wood, whatever I'm painting here is actually underneath the charcoal. So what I would actually need to do is go to the charcoal layer, add a paint effect. And instead of painting with white, because that makes more lead come out, I can paint with, say, black. You know, take, take some of this away. Or I could paint with white and maybe just make this look like the lead is showing through a bit further Again, just to kind of break up that edge so it's not so straight across. 
doesn't have to be super clean either. But even just that is enough. But from a distance, it kind of breaks it up a little bit. So it's not just this perfect line going across. And that's a big part of doing this texture work. You know, we did we did do use a lot of presets, like just dropping things on and changing colors and things, and that, that's fine. But what you really want to get into is get the habit of is getting in there and really starting to customize how these masks are affecting the object. And that's how you're going to get some ownership over what you're doing. All right, so here again, F1 or F3, if you want to just see oops, there we go, the texture view by itself. You can see here we have like our divots in there. We have our Dixon number two stamped into the side. We can see here our lead and such. Press the uh, F2 key or to go back to our 3D view like this. And yeah, we'll call it done. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'll file, save, and I'll make sure I go back to my pencil project. Now, and for substance, mine doesn't necessarily have a substance folder, but I, I might just save it in my scenes folder anyway. Call it pencil. Now, you might say, hey, we're done. Now, how do we get this into Maya to see it on the pencil there, right? Well, you have to remember, Maya over here is not a game. This is a 3D authoring tool. You can make 3D models. So you'd actually want to put it into a 3D engine such as Unity or Unreal or whatever. But I'll show you anyway how to export your textures. Go File, Export Textures. And this looks a little complicated, but what we really want to do here is choose where you're going to save your textures to. So I'll do that here. And if you remember, we're going to go to our source images folder on our pencil project right there. Because that's where Maya looks for textures. Now, as far as the output template and file type, you know, you can choose different kinds of images like Targa, for example. I use Targas a lot in the game industry. You can also use PNGs. And I don't recommend JPEGs because they're kind of a lossy uh, file type usually. And then for the size, Again, you can choose a different size. If you remember, we, we chose 2048. You can increase the size up or decrease it. So like, for example, this is a pencil, so it's not exactly huge. I could make it 1024, you know, but I'll keep it 1024 or 2048. Or you can just say, you know, based on what it was set to earlier. That's what this means. And then for the output template, there's lots of these. It's a little bit a lot to explain in this video here, but essentially it's exporting color, uh, metalness, and roughness, and normal and height, and all these things. And, and it's kind of hard to see them because they're kind of cut off here. But, go back to global settings here. So, as you can see, there's lots of different settings here. So, but you can see here, we have some Unity, all these Unity settings. If you're using the Unity engine, these are more like what you'd want to use. There's Unreal settings, the Unreal engine. And I'm sure they add more to this all the time. So I'm just going to use the PBR metallic roughness. That's just the kind of traditional uh, texture types. And let's see. Oh, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's calling this Lambert 1 because I didn't ever uh, change the material in Maya. That's okay. I'm going to hit Save Settings and go over here in this top window where it shows a texture set list. I can rename this texture set. Instead of Lambert 1, which is kind of boring, I can call it Pencil. So my textures then will take that same name, file, export textures again, and now it's called pencil. Okay, so now I'm going to hit export. And it's going to go through and export all these different textures. So you have base color, roughness, metallic, normal, and height. See here. So now I can go back to Maya. I can hide the high detail pencil and bring back the low detail like this. Now, in order to use a roughness map, because you remember we talked about materials and such, and again, this is a long, long video. I apologize. Hopefully it's useful. Long video here. But we have, go back to my material. Here we go. I'm actually going to assign a new material. Right-click and hold, assign a new material. And we can call it Lambert for now. But a Lambert, you'll see, doesn't have like a roughness setting to apply a roughness map to. It doesn't have a metalness or metallic setting to apply a metalness to. So the material, the textures that we're making for video games don't correspond with a Lambert or a blend that we've talked about before. So what I'm going to do is, for this type 
Lambert, I'm going to change this to something else. And I'm going to change it to what's called an AI standard surface. AI standard surface. And this one, you'll see, has metalness, has roughness, and, and those kinds of things. So now that I have a, a, the right kind of material applied, I can rename this material to be, say, pencil, MAT for material. And then I start applying my textures. So color, for example, I'll click on the checkerboard, file, and I'll add the base color texture. And you might not see it, but you have to press the 6 key, and now you can start to see those textures coming in and seeing the color. It looks a little dark right now, but that's okay. You can go back for metalness, apply a file, metallic, open. Now one thing that's important about the metalness texture is you always want to change the color space to be raw. This is by clicking this little drop down, utility, raw. Okay, just good rule of thumb. And then I can go to the color balance section down here. And these are just, these are things that you find out in the game industry. And these are just things I'm sharing with you now. Because again, this is kind of just showing you how I would do this for real, right? Alpha is luminance. Turn that on. I'll go back. Okay, then we go down here to specular and then roughness. Apply a file. Use the roughness. Again, this one should be raw. So change this to utility raw. Alpha is luminance. Same set, same kind of settings as the metallic one was. So that's three out of five. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll down here to geometry, and here we have bump mapping. I'm gonna map the bump mapping a file. And instead of using it as a bump map, I'm actually going to change this to use it as a tangent space normal map, which is what we do in video games. Then I can keep going to that little black arrow and, and then go to my normal map like this. Again, this one should be set to raw. There we go. Then you uncheck alpha is luminance. I don't think it makes a huge difference, but you don't necessarily have to have that one on. Okay, and then we go back. So you can start to see our pencil there might say, oh, it's kind of dark. So again, it, Maya is not a game engine. It makes sure that's clear. In order to see it properly, you have to have lights and things in the scene. We haven't talked about lights, you know. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff is uh, kind of going really fast for you, I'm sure. But I can create lights, okay? So you can feel free to explore through here and create, say, for example, a directional light. But in order to see a light in the scene, press the seven key, seven for lighting. I can maybe duplicate this light, make another one over here. Might rotate it around a little bit. Going to increase the intensity. All right, so again, you might also see that this down over here looks black. So again, the the, the problem, quote unquote, with uh, creating video game art uh, with Maya isn't necessarily a problem with Maya, it's just that it's meant to go into a video game. Maya is not a video game rendering system. So I feel like, in my opinion, if you really want to show off your textures you make for a game without having a, an actual game to put them in, is actually showing this. Like, take screenshots here in Substance Painter and show it off here. Because you see here it looks really nice because Substance Painter uses a game rendering engine. So this is what it actually will look like in your game. That's the point. You know, no, no pun intended there. The point. <laughs> so yeah, Maya is great for creating the models and the UVs and so on. Substance Painter is great for creating the textures. But when it comes to displaying the textures on the model, I would stick with Substance Painter for that. Not to say it's impossible to render something in Maya with these things. It's just much simpler. As you can see here, this is already done to see it here in Maya. All right, that was a really long lesson. And I feel like we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, everything involved with texturing. There's a whole lot more that you have to learn. But hopefully, this is, was like a little bit of a crash course, we'll say, on how to create a texture for an object from Maya to Substance Painter and back, so to speak, um, here in uh, this part of the Maya 101 series. All right, so going forward, where do we go from here? So we've kind of gone through 
a bit of you know all the base kind of basics for modeling, basics for UVs, you know, basics for materials, basics for creating textures here now in Substance Painter. So what's left? Well, you have basics for animation, for example, lighting, like we just th started talking about lights, you know, basics for lighting. Uh, so we have those two things for sure we can start talking about. We can also talk a little bit maybe about basic particle effects. There's all kinds of things that we still haven't touched on. Feel free to comment below if you have an idea of where you'd like to go from here, because there's lots of ways we could go with it. But uh, anyway, if you have any questions, and I'm, I'm sure you probably do, there's a lot of stuff we threw at you today. Um, definitely let me know and ask. Uh, I definitely, again, recommend getting your hands on Substance Painter in some way. It's super helpful and it's just really great, especially if you want to get into video games and that kind of thing. Uh, Substance Painter is really the way to go, even for films, really. Substance Painter works fine for creating film textures, too. They have other tools, too, like, uh, for example, there's one called, I think it's called Mara. I can't remember off the top of my head, now. I've never used it myself. It's uh, really popular. It's, it was used in a lot of really high budget uh, film projects and things. But again, I've never worked on a film myself. I've always used, well before Substance Painter, I used Photoshop and then Substance Painter for textures. But really, really powerful program, especially once you kind of get the hang of it, start learning and practicing more and more. So definitely I would recommend as far as homework goes, uh, if you have um, Substance Painter, you know, start, take that, take whatever simple objects you've made before and, and start trying to, you know, create little things with them. You can texture them. Um, do the UVs and such and bring them into Substance Painter and texture them. You don't have to do the baking thing with a high poly and a low poly model and so on like I did here, but that is very much the kind of the, the traditional way to go about uh, creating uh, a detailed uh, texture like this one. Like all, all these details with the the ridges and so on and, and the, the ID map for the color masking and all that kind of stuff all came about with that high to low poly uh, transition with the baking. All right, I'm going to call it done for now. I hope this video was helpful. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing going through so much really quickly all at once. Feel free to watch again. Maybe it'll make more sense the second time. But then again, uh, ask, ask questions if you have any. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.